young Earth creationism is precluded entirely by dozens upon dozens of well-known facts of the natural world. From the radioactive decay law, the speed of light, and the nature of the geologic column, to the statistics that surround common ancestry, the fossil record, and our genetic relationship to the rest of the primates, mammals, and really just the entire tree of life. But so frequently I encounter what I am calling bite-size busts, aspects of STEM fields that entirely preclude young earth creationism that aren't typically talked about, but bust hard nevertheless. Be it geology, anthropology, astronomy, or physics, here we discuss the minutia of fields that leave young earth creationism out in the cold. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe if you like this kind of content, leave a like and maybe a comment, and if you feel like supporting the channel in other ways, you can check out my Patreon, my PayPal, or stores. Today we are talking about how the tilt of the Earth, along with its processional cycles and associated climatic changes, entirely preclude young Earth creationism. I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shock. The Earth rotates around the Sun while also rotating itself on an axis of approximately 23.45 degrees. This axial tilt, which may have been due to Earth's early collision with ancient planet Theia, is not always constant, though. Much like the physics observed in action with a toy gyroscope, Earth's axial tilt and rotation means that over time our world wobbles on its axis, between 24.5 and 22.1 degrees. This wobble effect, as well as the precession of the Earth, means our planet's climate is constantly changing. Let's take a look at how monsoons change in relation to the axial tilt and precession of the planet. Monsoons refer to the yearly period of intense wind and rain experienced by certain parts of the planet like Southeast Asia. Yearly monsoonal circulations occur because the land responds to seasonal changes in solar radiation more quickly than water does, as land cannot hold heat as efficiently as water can. This creates a monsoon circulation as warm air above the continents expands and rises, creating a pressure differential and pulling water vapor from the ocean. This vapor condenses and falls, creating the monsoon season. We observe this process each and every year, and ultimately, where and when monsoons occur falls to the position and tilt of the Earth. So, given the seasons change each and every year on our planet, based off of the position of the Earth and its precession, as well as its relative tilt, we should expect monsoons to respond, in turn, in predictable ways, again, each and every year. So, do they change in predictable ways? Of course they do! Monsoons are incredibly predictable each and every year, because in the end, this boils down to a simple equation. Position of the Earth, axial tilt, and sun exposure of the continents. Likewise, we should be able to run back the clock on the Earth's precession and tilt, as again this is predictable and modeled in physics, and we should be able to calculate the expected monsoon behavior in a given location for a given millennia. This creates a lovely and very robust and very precise prediction for old Earth, or the ancient age of the Earth. This is because based off of the rate of precession and how the Earth wobbles on its axis, physics predicts that we should see these particular monsoon cycles in the northern and southern hemisphere go through their circulation once every 23,000 years, which of course precludes young Earth creationism outright given they have only 6,000. Young Earth creationism requires a spontaneous creation event some 6,000 years ago, as well as a global flood event some 4,400 years ago that is responsible for all layers of the geologic column from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, as well as their fossils, every impact event or mass extinction signature within said layers, the current positioning of the continents, the state of decay of all radioactive elements, and finally, the various levels of diversity for all extant life. But before we check the rocks, the geologic record to see if indeed monsoon intensity alternates with what physics predicts with the precession and tilt of the Earth, let's refine our hypothesis a little bit more. 
Given the behavior of monsoons today, during higher periods of summer sun exposure in the past, monsoons should have been stronger, and during lower periods of summer sun exposure in the past, monsoons should have been weaker. Based off of the predictable movement of the Earth in rotation, precession, and tilt, this monsoon cycle should appear as a series of plottable waves that look something like this. <laughs> Formally, this is known as the orbital monsoon hypothesis, and fortunately for us, it is testable in a wide variety of ways. The first is by measuring sediment patterns in large seas like the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean today has water with a high oxygen content. To put things simply, high oxygen allows plankton to thrive and results in sediment typical of a high oxygen environment that appears as tan, silty, and full of microscopic shells. The converse of this is low oxygen environments, which results in sapropels. These inky black layers are the result of anoxic waters being unable to convert organic material that sinks down from the surface to inorganic carbon and allows for the deposition of iron sulfide. This gives these layers a stinky scent that smells like rotten eggs. Seas like the Mediterranean are fed by freshwater rivers, but when too much fresh water inundates the sea, a density differential is created that allows for anoxia in the depths. This means that when African monsoons were intense and rivers dumped rainwater into the sea, we should expect to see inky black layers. Conversely, when the monsoons were light in Africa, as they are today, we should expect to see the modern tan silt. Mediterranean layers alternate in time with the orbital monsoon hypothesis predictions and the rise and fall of monsoon intensity in Africa, with the most recent sapropel being dated to 8,000 to 10,000 years ago, when monsoons were intense. <laughs> Now many other seas and lakes follow this sedimentary pattern that we find in the Mediterranean, but what other lines of evidence can we look to to either support or deny the orbital monsoon hypothesis? How about diatomes? Diatomes are a type of plankton that can come in freshwater and saltwater varieties. See my other video for how plankton really busts young earth creationism. If one follows the wind patterns from the Sahara into the Atlantic Ocean and cores the sea at that one spot, freshwater diatomes can be found interspersed with saltwater diatomes at 23,000 year intervals. What are freshwater plankton doing off the coast of Africa? Ecological work done on these plankton shows that they are typically found in the freshwater lakes of Africa. When these lakes dry up, the organisms within them desiccate, and the lightest ones can be blown by the wind to new locations. Freshwater diatoms found in the Atlantic sea cores exclusively at the 23,000 year tempo set by the orbital monsoon hypothesis naturally support the idea. Perhaps the most concrete support, however, though, for the orbital monsoon hypothesis comes from cave deposits. Stalactites and stalagmites are geologic formations found in caves and formed by groundwater from above percolating down through soil and rock. This groundwater picks up and then leaves behind calcite, which is the material that actually builds the stalactites and stalagmites. However, calcite holds a record of the oxygen content of the water that carried it a ratio of oxygen 18 and oxygen 16. This ratio can help us determine ancient temperatures in given locations, with higher amounts of oxygen 18 being indicative of a cooler climate. As such, changes in the monsoon cycle should be able to be accurately reconstructed using the oxygen 18, oxygen 16 ratios in calcite. Caves in China reflect the orbital monsoon hypothesis with unbelievable precision, going back 160,000 years and documenting the ebb and flow of the monsoon intensity of the region as dictated by the precession and axial tilt of the Earth. But a really excellent way to test the robusticity of the orbital monsoon hypothesis would be to run these same tests on a cave in the southern hemisphere. This is because the monsoons, like the seasons that we experience here in North America in the United States, are inverted in the southern and northern hemispheres. When we are experiencing winter up here, they experience summer in the south. 
So researchers performed the same sampling in caves in Brazil, and while this record only went back 120,000 years, it was a perfect inverse to the data from China, brilliantly supporting the orbital monsoon hypothesis, and all but definitively showcasing that the precession and tilt of the Earth dictate major climatic patterns occurring over hundreds of thousands of years. So why exactly is this problematic for young Earth creationism? Because these monsoon data, the monsoon cycling, is directly tied to the tilt of the Earth and its precession. That means if we have records going back 160,000 years, this isn't going to work with a 6,000 year time frame. So they have to cram all that cycling into a 6,000 year range, right? You're going from 160,000, cramming it down into 6,000 years. And the problem with that is, if monsoons are indeed tied to the precession and tilt of the Earth, then you're having to invoke some absolutely insane orbital mechanics in order to cram the big time span into the small time span, right? The Earth has to be proceeding faster, and it's got to be wobbling faster in the past than it is now. This is, of course, a physics-defying notion with absolutely zero data to back it up, and given the precession and tilt impact every aspect of seasonality in every part of the planet, it should be really stinking obvious in every geologic way that records seasonality, from varves to ice cores. But it actually gets even worse than that. Recall that young Earth creationists think that most of the geologic column was laid down during the global flood of Noah, and they usually take that up into the Cretaceous, the end of the dinosaurs. So anything after the Cretaceous, and in this case that's going to be the very recent past, so the Pleistocene and the Holocene of around 160,000 years ago, is going to have happened during the post-flood time period, which means humans would have been around to observe what's going on. That makes it really hard to invoke the magic physics that happened during the flood where radioactive decay was happening faster and deposition was happening faster, and they basically just use it as an excuse to speed up the rates of things that we know happen slowly. But how are you going to do that if the flood wasn't laying down these monsoon records? Instead, these records occurred after the Flood in the view of young Earth creationists, and thus the precession of the Earth was necessarily faster in the more recent past, when humans were actively recording history. And yet none of them noticed that the stars in their sky were changing every single day thanks to the orbital speeds required by young Earth creationism to make the monsoon records fit. <laughs> So you might be thinking, how do young Earth creationists reckon with the fact that the precession of the Earth, its tilt, and the corresponding seasonality and monsoons entirely preclude their insane and ridiculous time frame of 6,000 years? Well, they just ignore it in this case. I know that's a common answer, but it is as true here as it was with the plankton. That's why I think this is one of the more damning of the bite-sized busts, because if you can't invoke magic physics to speed up the precession of the Earth and its wobble on its tilt, how do you explain the monsoon records going back 160,000 years and corroborating across the North and the South and with the diatomes and with the sedimentation of the Mediterranean? You can't. So it does indeed seem that these factors preclude young Earth creationism. So join me next time, my gentle and of course very modern apes, for another bite-sized bust to some big pseudoscience.